As I mentioned at the start of class, this is going to be your last team deliverable. Uh, we'll have two more individual deliverables. One will be a code review, and the other one will be your uh, your lessons learned feedback. But this will be your test plan. Now, obviously, what your test plan is is how do we know we've actually built what we're building? So what you want to do is sit down with your requirements and say, what is it that we need to do to see that we're, our demo will actually function? Now, let's talk first about software quality assurance in general. <coughs> first, single biggest fallacy, testing is software quality assurance. Now, testing is a very small part of software quality assurance. And the problem with many, many organizations is they only think of testing when it comes to SQA. Uh, it's basically all your deliverables need to be tested. This is, this is, <laughs> I apologize for quoting myself. I wrote a white paper that I said, I was uh, consulting at Fannie Mae and uh, was actually overseeing about 25 consultants there. So I was, I was the, the chief consultant there. <laughs> and they were moving towards object-oriented development and one of the non-technical managers said, well, we're using object technology, it means you don't have to test anything, and all this works, doesn't it? Uh, and one of the technical managers came to me and said, please help me. <laughs> I've got to somehow convince this, this non-technical manager that no, we actually do need testing. Uh, and I ended up writing a white paper there that uh, I've continued to use for 25 years now that basically said, here, here is the essence of software quality assurance. <clears throat> And the idea is that quality assurance occurs through the entire software process. Everyone involved has an, has an impact on it. It's not a separate activity done by a separate activity, by a separate organization. You, you may and possibly very well should. And this, this is a perennial debate. In fact, this is something Chuck uh, Knitz and I used to have arguments on, with all the time, is whether or not you have a separate SQA department or not. <coughs> and. Uh, to be honest, as I sit here, I can't remember which of us we're arguing for which side. Anyway, the, uh, while a given individual or team may oversee QA, all other members of the team are equally responsible for quality assurance. There is a syndrome, and this is, I think, I think Chuck was arguing against a separate QA team because he said, here's what happens. The developers implement a bug and then they throw it over the transom to QA. They say, find the problems with this. And of course, QA is now dealing with something that the developers have not tested. <laughs> have, not, have not basically tried to make as bulletproof as possible. And you end up, and then they throw it back and say, hey guys, this, this is worthless. You haven't even tested anything. And then, you know, developers do a few things and throw it back over. And it's kind of like, you know, volleyball or badminton, uh, passing the code back and forth. And no one's really taking responsibility for it. Uh, what I, what I came up with back in 96 and have continued to use ever since, uh, well, let me actually, before I get to that point, core values, and I talked about these when we talked about architecture, these same core values. That's not a coincidence. You want to design these core values into your solution. So when you're testing, when you're doing quality assurance, the questions are, how reliable is it? How, does it, you know, is it sufficiently reliable? Does it perform things in a sufficient time? Does it have all the essential functionality? Is it compatible with all the other systems? Is it going to live longer than six months? Can we deploy it and use it? Can we readily support it? And how much is it all going to cost? These are core quality values, and they need to be all considered from the very start. Now, you may prioritize some of these depending upon what you're developing. <clears throat> if you're writing a little program for yourself, well, I, I write programs still on a regular basis, usually when I'm having to analyze data in a case I'm working on. Uh, I had a case where I had to analyze two sets of source code, one in Java, one in C++, see how many object names came over, uh, see how deep the object tree was on each side, and so on. 
and I wrote some rather quick and dirty programs in, in uh, Python and was looking up stuff on you know, Stack Overflow. Okay, how do I do this? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I got that working. <clears throat> By contrast, uh, early in my career, I worked on the Space Shuttle Flight Simulator, which probably, the NASA probably spent more money per line of code for the Space Shuttle than just about any other project. The way it worked with the Space Shuttle is that they had four computers I'll actually draw something. Basically, each computer had all the data inputs from the all various shuttle systems and then had data outputs controlling various shuttle systems. And there were four of these. They were all running identical software, all had identical inputs, and all their outputs were in essence put into a box where they would vote. So if three of the computers said, this is a signal that should be going out to control the system, and the fourth computer said, no, it's a different signal, the majority would win. Now most of you will look at this and say, but what about a tie? What NASA did is they used an entirely different company, Rockwell, with a fifth computer. Same specification, but developed completely separately. So it would have the same inputs, and it would have the same outputs, and in case there was a two to two tie here, the Rockwell software would, would break the tie. Uh, it was extremely, I mean, you're talking about a multi-billion dollar spaceship with live humans in it. The irony with all this is that actually the first shuttle launch was delayed for, 40, for, for 48 hours due to a software bug. But it wasn't here. The bug was at with the, uh, <coughs> with the shuttle. You have the space shuttle sitting on the pad. So here's the space shuttle, pods, uh, pad, and so on. Over here, you've got ground control, and there's a computer called the Launch Processing System. And it has complete control of the space shuttle up until 30 seconds before launch. That was actually my responsibility on the space shuttle flight simulator. I was responsible for the LPS simulation. At 30 seconds before launch, you would turn control over to these five shuttle computers. The problem was there was a subtle software bug such that the LPS and the five computers here had a 40 millisecond difference in their clocks. And so they could never agree what time it was. So whenever this wanted to hand it off, the shuttle said, wait, wait, it's not time yet, and would refuse it. Uh, I actually know the guy who fixed the bug. He got a $1,500 bonus, which in 1981 terms is pretty hefty. It's like a month's pay. He was a programmer at IBM. He was one who cracked down and fixed the bug. His, his wife was my office mate at Lunar Planetary Institute, which is where I was working by then. So these are core values in software and they have to be addressed at all levels. Architecture, design, implementation, everything. Now this is the diagram that I came up with 25 years ago which I still use. I call it inside out because instead of seeing testing as something tacked on in the end, all your process activities which are either modifying or creating a new deliverable, whether that is your specifications, your architecture, your design, your code, uh, your test plan, all that gets created here. What goes into it? Well, whatever methodology will determine how the deliverable will look. 
Uh, you may be modifying or building upon existing deliverables. In other words, if I have a design document, that's going to impact when I'm creating code. Any agreed upon guidelines and standards. Expertise of the people involved. You want people who actually know what they're doing. Key company values. That goes back to are we trying to uh, do something where we're giving a release on a very short cycle and do stuff? Or is this something where we're, you know, human lives are at stake? and we want things uh, working correctly. <clears throat> With your new modified deliverable, you gather metrics, you review it with humans, you test it by humans and by automation. All of those you use to evaluate. Uh, you then check in the, the approved or unapproved thing into your configuration release management. You have a defect or feature management. Someone mentioned Bugzilla. Uh, this is where you're tracking defects to be fixed and or features to be added. You look for ways to improve your process and deliverable, and from here you decide when you're going to actually release the software. There is nothing ground shaking about this other than it forces you to realize that SQA affects every single thing you do within a software development project. And the more conscious you are of these as inputs and of doing all this for whatever you're creating, the better your software will be, in my opinion. Any questions? Comments? Yeah, I don't get It's like, uh, can we get through this, Professor Webster? Okay, we just talked about, okay, what the things are. Methodology, defining the steps and deliverables. Key values, what's important for your product or your company, expertise, having people who know what they're doing, requirements and guidelines. How many of you have ever worked on a project that has coding standards or guidelines? Uh, I think they should be used more often. I've written coding standards and guidelines. Did it in pages, did it in Eric. They're not always well received. <laughs> uh, metrics, we, we had old electron metrics. Reviews, ensuring that all deliverables have had human judgment passed on them by multiple persons and open discussion. Uh, <clears throat> this is a useful way of finding bugs. I've, I've already mentioned here one of my favorite debugging techniques as an individual programmer when I'm stuck on a bug is to call someone else in and start to explain what I'm stuck on. And over 50% of the time I'll get halfway through and say never mind. I, I see what the problem is. Uh, the rest of the time, it's usually they'll see what the problem is, or we'll both look at it and say, huh, that's really weird. Uh, that happens too. Uh, actual testing, uh, configuration management. Uh, you'd be surprised how many organizations still do not do professional <laughs> configuration management. Uh, I had a project, uh, or I had a, had a case that I worked on. That was a big ERP installation with programmers literally scattered around the world and they had no configuration management whatsoever. Code updates were passed around by email. <laughs> oh my gosh. And were often lost <laughs> in the process. There was no way to go back and say, how did the code look as of this date? Uh, it was, it, I, I, I my, my comment, and I, I, I'm sure I said this in my report, and I think I said it in open court, I said this is professional malpractice. You know, at Pages, when we were just starting up, after I had hired two other programmers, we implemented source code control. Uh, because by then we had three programmers working on it, and we, we had to have that, that level of uh, control and uh, reliability. Uh, defect feature management, process deliverable, Improvement, learn from your mistakes. Okay. Sometimes the software testing. I often debate. I think I should give a long lecture on software testing. I give a whole class for on software testing. Uh, but I'm not. Uh, <laughs> basically, testing tends to go from smallest to greatest. Unit or class testing. How many of you have used uh, unit test frameworks and so on and so forth? This, you know, this is something I watched grow up and it's wonderful because you can catch an awful lot of stuff right off the bat. Uh, then you start 
Tenant groups are related units. You get everything together. You go end to end. You try it in a production environment. You do per performance stress testing. It's stunning to me how many organizations fail to do that. That's pretty much what happened with the uh, uh, Iowa caucuses. Uh, everything shut down. They weren't they weren't set up to do the stress. It actually would help with what happened with Orca as well. Uh, user acceptance, usability testing, and regression testing. Uh, you'll see various figures, but the one I like to rely upon is about you have about a 15% chance every time you fix a bug of introducing a new bug or reawakening re an old one. Personally, I think it's probably higher than that, but uh, and it depends on, on how big a change you're making. Okay, so your test plan. Here's the, I, I will get these slides up, I promise today. I apologize for the slides for the architecture design back then. Uh, your test plan doesn't have to be long. It's, this, this is, you know, you're four weeks till you're shipping. But the question is, how are you going to ensure that you're actually building what you plan to show uh, in four weeks? So it should tie back to your requirements of design. Mostly, I would like to see test plans that focus on reliability, performance, and functionality. Uh, those are three of the key aspects. Uh, is it operating correctly? Is it operating fast <coughs> enough? Uh, and does it do everything it needs to do? Now, that's a roughly in priority because how do you deal with the slip schedule? You throw away functionality. You start to drop that. Uh, reliability and performance really can, can drop less. Uh, as I've already said at Pages, one of, one of the big focuses for many, many, many months is the very simple task of pressing a key on the keyboard and having a letter appear in the right place on the screen within a tenth of a second. Most people will not tolerate slower response times than that on word processors. And you wouldn't believe how hard it is to get that loop and have that fast a loop while you're doing everything else simultaneously. Because you're having to relay out columns, you're moving stuff around, headlines are floating down, you're floating stuff over the pages, footnotes are moving, footnotes, oh man, footnotes are a nightmare if you ever do word processor. Uh, so, just indicate what tests you're going to be done and how you're going to do it, what's going to be successful. I don't expect this to be long. Go back and look at some of the previous uh, test plans. I'm not expecting a lot here. What I'm expecting you to do is to actually think about what you're doing and how you're verifying your stuff for your, for your demo. Yes? So to be clear, your scalability is not something we're going to be worried about. You're probably not worried about scalability here, yeah. Uh, you know, unless you're really planning in one of your two demos to like, like get 100 people to use it simultaneously. And you can, you can argue scalability, you can fold it into performance, but there, there are other issues with scalability because in some cases it's literally the number of connections that can be made to the back end system simultaneously, as opposed to simply you know, how fast the little sprite moves across the screen. So we can kind of design our tests toward the... Demos. That's, a, that's exactly what you want. Your test, this test plan should be designed towards your two demos. <coughs> You know, what are we going to do for each of the two demos, and how are we going to test it so that we can actually show this in class in four weeks and then again in eight weeks? Uh, first draft due midnight, but will likely be revised for the semester. So by midnight Saturday, you have your test plan up, your new status report, uh, another podcast. Next week, we've got uh, Mythical Man Month, chapters 16 and 17. I believe that's the No Silver Bullet stuff. <coughs> people Wear Part 2. That's chapter 7 through 13. That sounds like a lot, but People Wear is a fast read. It's a breezy style. They have large margins. They have large print. Uh, Accelerate Chapter 9, Webster number 6. First demo in four weeks, midterm in five weeks. Any questions? So, no, let's get out of here. Okay. Thanks, you all been great. Uh, and we'll see you next week. Next month.